All right, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Today is June the 25th, 2017, and half the year's gone already, I guess. Wow. Um, but all you fans out there, I know there's a million Kelly Young fans. He's not here today because apparently his birthday is more important. Today is Kelly Young's birthday. I think, I think he turns... What do you guys figure, 58, 59? Um, I think oh. it's hurt because we didn't send him any presents. Well, you he, mean besides the gift of our friendship? <laughs> <laughs> We're friends with him. What more does he want? <laughs> a drink. I got a kid going to college, you know. I don't have any extra cash laying around. <laughs> My oldest heads off next fall. Yeah, mine goes August 20th. Let's do introductions and talk about the prizes, um, and then um, talk to Soren Narnia, who's our guest today. Um, prizes, I'm giving away from David Del Cole. Excuse me, let me pull it up. Uh, Whispers from the Abyss. It's an anthology edited by, edited by Kat Roca. Hope I'm saying her last name right. And that's, that's prize number one. We'll tell you how to win that a little bit later. Although, if you listen to this show a lot, I'm sure you know. Um, and then, Matt, you have a prize. Oh, yeah. This is a nice, um, entertaining novel from Dark Regions Press. It's the second in a series. Well, Wolf Hunt 2, for those Wolf listening. Hunt 2. Uh, it's by Jeff Strand. It's a very amusing and uh, a really nice wolf, uh, werewolf kind of read. Okay. Sounds good. Well... Let's do introductions and start with Matt. Uh, hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. I am uh, supposedly editing Pickman's Gallery, uh, which should be getting off the ground here soon. Pete. Uh, Pete Rollick, uh, writer, and I'm supposedly editing the Chromatic Court. You guys, are you supposedly editing editing something, Rick? No, I just all I do is contribute to the Chromatic Court. Oh, okay. Well, I'm Rick Lay, writer. All right. And I'm Mike Davis. Um, did prizes. I want to read the Knife Point Horror Podcast description. Uh, These tales of supernatural suspense by Soren Narnia adhere to the most primal element of storytelling. A single human voice describing events as exactly as it experienced them. The stories stripped of even proper titles spill forward as taut, uninterrupted confessions. Knife Point Horror leaves nothing but the story's riveting spine to compel and chill you to the core. Um, so why don't you introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we can get into the podcast stuff. Yeah, hey everybody. Uh, my name is Sornani. I uh, put together a podcast called Knife Point Horror. Uh, it's, this is about five years ago. It's essentially just a collection of uh, short stories uh, narrated. Um, Ghost, supernatural, horror, suspense, what have you. Uh, I also do some other kinds of writing, more straight-laced writing. Uh, not as popular, of course. But uh, that's pretty much my story. I'm here uh, just outside of D.C. in Northern Virginia, Falls Church, hanging out. And uh, that's my life in its entirety. Well, I stumbled on your podcast, I don't know, um, six or eight months ago. And... I was just Googling horror podcasts because I like to listen to old time radio podcasts, whatever, as I go to sleep at night and sometimes during the day. And it really stood out to me as something very, very different from any other horror podcast. For one thing, I'm very easy to, I'm, pardon me, I'm, I'm not very easy to scare or creep out. And I believe Staircase was the first story I listened to. And I just thought, wow, this guy's good. So <laughs> had to keep listening and get you on the show. Um, you know, it's interesting you say, you mentioned um, late at night when you're kind of falling asleep. Right. And that's kind of what hooked me on listening to podcasts originally. I found it like it's just very relaxing and, and peaceful to drift off, drift off the, the sound of the human voice. You know, I had been using baseball to do that. And then podcasting kind of crept in there. And, you know, I get, I swear, half the emails I get mention, people mention, you know, I know this sounds strange, but 
I use it as kind of a sedative. And when I'm drifting off at night, I'm like, you know what? I know exactly what you're talking about. And there's something deep psychologically going on there. I don't know what it is. But, uh, yeah, it's very, very common. Something about that single human voice. Yeah, something about a voice just talking to you in the darkness. Yeah. I wonder if I could be just reading anything, like recipes on the side of a cereal box. And well, you know, I've, I, I've listened – I. I've listened to all kinds of things in the past, you know, when, before podcasts were, were popular, um, just anything I could find on the radio, you know, yeah. things yeah. like that. The, the radio was even better when you have that kind of far away scratching uh, the um, FM static, you know, even AM radio, even better. Right. Nothing exactly. Better, nothing better in a dark room than that AM radio static. You know? I have, I have very good memories as a kid of listening to um, CBS radio mystery theater. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going up, went it from 1974 to 1982, right? And yeah, exactly what you're talking about. For me, it was um, my father would take us to Orioles games, uh, and late at night, I would lie in the back seat when we were driving home, and the post game would come on. You know, it'd be like 11:30 at night. I was 10 years old, and I always thought I want to be that guy, just doing the post game. <laughs> I want to be that guy. This is this is great. Uh, and so uh, that's that was my ambition, pretty much. And I almost, and every, I almost nailed it. <laughs> well, no, I, I think you're, yeah, you're pretty close, or some would say surpassed it. Um, w not every story that is on the podcast is weird fiction, but there are some very good weird fiction, what I would call weird fiction um, stories on the podcast, and. Weird fiction is something that we talk about a lot on this show. Um, I think the stories on the Knife Point Horror podcast that are weird fiction are some of the finest examples of weird fiction that I've ever heard. And I've, I've read a lot of weird fiction. I know these guys have too. So, Thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. When you say weird fiction, like the first thing that pops in my mind, of course, is kind of a 50s pulp cover. Yeah. And, uh, I used to entertain myself by thinking of what the – that kind of cover would look like when I was writing these stories. Um, and I always thought one day maybe I'll, in my apartment I'll have, you know, covers like that hanging up everywhere that inspire me. But, uh, yeah, it's good to hear, though. Well, there's stories in something in which something, I said this when we did the video test to you, where something strange, something weird happens. The protagonist is saying, look, uh, here's something weird that happened to me, something very strange. I can't explain it. I don't understand what it is, what exactly happened, but here's what happened. And yeah. 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 Um, I, like it. I like it when the, the key is the inability to explain. Uh, to me, that's the, that's the foundation for, for, for really good, weird fiction. Like uh, it's, I find it uh, difficult to, kind of give any real logical underpinning to a lot of things what happened that happened in these stories and the sooner I stop thinking about that the better it's it's just it's more satisfying than wow why the hell did this happen to this person and it always makes it scarier yeah more. like I don't want to give anything away in any of these stories because I really think everyone listening to, to my podcast could, should go and listen to your podcast but one of my favorite stories is uh, fields and there are a lot of weird things that happen in that story, but one of them is uh, a vulture approaches a tent and it's the woman's tent and it's never explained why as many things are not explained, but that's just something that happened. And the protagonist has no idea why it happened. Right. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And that, that um, a lot of nasty things happened in that story, but that's, that's, I like the little details like that because it's in itself, there's nothing sinister about a, vulture landing outside a tent, walking into the tent, and then you don't see it for a while, then it comes out. But uh, the fact that I think it's in there for hours, maybe, uh, unexplained. Watching her while she sleeps. Right. It's like, why? Why? You know, um, I do, I, I like that. Uh, when I'm reading a good piece of weird fiction, I like, like, yeah, I'll never get an explanation for that. Never. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. I, I do like that a lot. Uh, guys, as always, if you have questions, please feel free to jump in. Um, well, I thought actually, yeah, it's it's even not so much weird fiction, but one story I really liked was Attic, and the reason was you never quite know what's in the bag. Yeah, right. I don't want to give anything away, but it's like it's very similar. 
it's very it's very tense at the end, but you still don't quite know what happened. Uh, yeah, if I ever if I ever wind up just explaining too much, yeah, the just the for me the actually the enjoyment disappears if if, if everything is explained. You know, if if everything could be explained, then it's no longer weird fiction. It's just um, it's just a right. straight suspense story. And I, for some reason, I've never been able to write a straight up. It's always got to be something unexplained. Maybe I don't think life is quite interesting enough as is. You know, the reality of life to me is going to get groceries and getting a job, and I always need a something something vaguely odd. You know, give it that little sheen. Well, and Lovecraft wrote Fear of the Unknown. You know, that's once it becomes known, it's you're not nearly as afraid of it, if at all. You know, he stole that quote from me, by the way. I just want to let everyone know. Lovecraft did, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, how did you get started in writing? I mean, this has been a while now that you've been doing this. Uh, yeah, since I was like six or seven years old, I was writing um, kind of unusual stories. I think it may have been my grandmother's fault. She... Uh, she gave me a copy, kind of like a scholastic edition of Dracula when I was very young, you know, illustrated, and they cut it down to like, you know, 80 pages. Uh, and I just found it kind of riveting, and I'm not sure why to me. And, of course, that character to me is just the granddaddy of them all. So I think I grew up kind of trying to simulate that kind of feel. Then I read a book uh, called The House with the Clock in Its Walls by John Belairs. Ah, yeah, I've read that. Growing up. Yeah. Which I didn't think anyone else knew about, but apparently Eli Roth is making a movie out of it now. Um, really? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that book had um, those great Edward Gorey drawings in it. And the, just experiences like that, I just I found that so riveting that I, I developed a desire to recreate that. Uh, at first for myself, you know, when I was 10 years old, no one was reading these things. I was writing them for myself, just for the satisfaction of it. And... Uh, it never stopped. It just never stopped. You want to bring others that same feeling that you experienced, that same mood. I do, and for different reasons now. For now, now I like it because it's difficult, um, and because uh, and there's a satisfaction when you, you know, as you all know, when you arrive at that that one scene, where you're really going for the ultimate effect that you've you've thought of, and you think you've nailed it. You think I've got it. Uh, I, I think I'm always going after that that feeling. Um, so that, that never stops getting old. You know, when you think you finally twisted things just enough, you wrote a scene a certain way, created a moment of suspense, and now you can move on to the next thing. So, um, yeah. It's, how, how difficult is it for you to write the average story? Yeah, you know, 15 years ago it was kind of a breeze, and it's gotten harder and harder every year. Um, now it takes about twice as much thinking uh, as it used to. Um, my mind is not making the swift connections um, that I used to. I'm not quite able to layer stories with multiple um, themes and meanings like I used to. So it's, it's getting tough. It's getting real hard. And in the case of a story like Fields, um, that almost knocked me out of creative writing entirely. I thought that's I'm done. I may as well try to you know make a living in the NBA for as difficult as this is getting. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's 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 not easy. It's getting, it's getting a little bit tougher every. But every the year. end product is phenomenal. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I eventually I, I do come to a point where I'm happy with it. I'm still able to get to that point, and I don't have any regrets. But um, we'll see how long I can keep this going. So you've done work both in you know for your podcast, but also for print. I, I've done something similar, but I'm wondering you if you face similar problems in that the way you write something to be read is different than when you write something to be uh, yeah. spoken. Yeah, it's completely different. In fact, I was never that happy with um, putting this stuff into print because you're right. It's, it's complete. These more and more, these stories have been written directly for the voice. And that is completely different. Um, interesting though is that when it does hit the page, I think it, some of the stuff might still work because it's so reductive. It, you know, it's so stripped down. There's no, there's no fat on it. So in a way, um, it still kind of works, but just not. You don't get quite the full, quite the full effect. But I'm starting to lose interest entirely in writing for print because I, I do find the whole process of 
uh, the voice acting and the uh, creating the effects, even laying in the music. Um, I like that so much now that I'm, I'm starting to think about leaving the, the page entirely. Plus, there's always the nice thing, you know, you, you do a podcast and the, the feedback is so instantaneous. And it's such a, a convenient way to get an audience that you can, you can see the numbers, you can get emails from people immediately, you're not waiting for anyone. Uh, everything is under your control, 100%. And I, that gets addictive really quick. You know, I could definitely use a good editor to slap me on the wrist once in a while and say, dude, what? no, no. <laughs> However, that would mean, uh, but you know, the thing is you get so soft when you become, when you go into podcasting and just archiving your stories online, you get real soft and, and cushy. Um, it's a nice, nice feeling. Um, so it's kind of, kind of an addiction. You gotta, you gotta watch out. Um, you know, Go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry. I'm wondering who who influenced you as a writer. I know you talked about reading an abbreviated Dracula, but uh, were there any authors that uh, really had an influence on you when you were like uh, starting to mature? Uh, yeah. You know, I used to go to the library a lot and go to the section where they had the um, the old falling apart copies of like the Victorian ghost stories. Um. So a lot of the stories like that, you know, the M.R. Jameses, the uh, Ambrose Bierce, uh, Algernon Blackwood, a lot of individual stories like that. I think I like them because essentially there was uh, an unspoken production code back then. You didn't talk about gore. You didn't talk about sex. That just wasn't an option. So everything had to be more atmospheric and more and, and different. I always liked that vibe. And then, you know, hit the teenage years, and then, you know, S Stephen King took over, of course. You know, I was in a pharmacy one day, and I saw that old cover of Harry, the one with Sissy Spacek standing there with the blood all over her, and I was done. I, I had to start reading Stephen King. And, <laughs> and mixed in there, you know, I had a lot of Poe, and then I didn't discover Lovecraft until I was about 22, I think. Didn't even know he existed. Um, and to me, he was the best possible scenario of that old-fashioned um, horror story, but with the added benefit of he was going places that none of these other people were going. Uh, you know, granted, it was the 20s. He had more, more unspoken freedom uh, to get much darker. But he, he just hit on that perfect um, comfort food level of, you know, every story was kind of a vague recycling of the other stories. But I love that. that it's, that's such a nice feeling. You just sink into it, ooze into it, if you will. So, and he, be, he had a big influence on me also. But a lot of old school guys for me, a lot of old school people. Well, and he, he did write that atmosphere and not action is what was important in weird fiction. Um, right. Another I agree. Quote, Just about action to keep the plot going forward and then yeah. hit the atmosphere hard. Yep. I agree. Another Lovecraft quote that I thought of and had to copy down to read on the show today. Uh, the true weird tale has something more than secret murder, bloody bones, or a sheeted form clanking chains according to rule, a certain atmosphere of breathless and unexplainable dread of outer unknown forces must be present. So. Agreed. The sense that something in the universe has gone wrong and you can't put your finger on it and there's nothing you can do about it, but there's some, some layer somewhere that you're not seeing that's starting to control everything that's happening to you. Horrifying feeling. I can't imagine what it's actually like in real life. But uh, that's, it's a great engine for a horror story. Well, Matt asked you a minute ago um, about who inspired you. Can I ask what inspired some of your stories? You know, I don't have to list each one, of course, but have there been any real life inspirations for stories and any real life inspirations um, for some of the characters? Uh, you know, I tend to get my ideas the same way every time it's whenever i have a slightly different experience than is normal i go to a slightly different place take a drive meet someone who's just a little off kilter uh it doesn't take going to you know egypt or you know anything exotic it's just doing something a little bit different noticing for instance fields the story i was just walking uh, in a place that for some reason had uh an area that had they had let a, some field 
become totally overgrown for years. You know, I saw what that was like, what happens, how the, um, the plants and the, the grasses just take hold. And it reached a point where there was no going back. Like I didn't, they would take a cruise of men to, to rectify and turn this back into a normal field that had gone on so long. And then, and then instantly the, this, the idea for fields came. But it was solely because I had not seen a site like that before. You know, and recently I had experience uh, to go to a nursing home. I had never really been in one before. The simple act of going there spurred something because it was all new to me. I happened to look over and I saw a pitcher of water on a table. And suddenly that started ideas flowing. So uh, the only advice I ever really give to writers is, you know, if you're looking to, for ideas, just do something different. Anything, you know, uh, if it's Sunday night, and you've never gone to uh, a dive bar like midnight on a Sunday, when the real hardcore, do it. Just go do it. Just for an hour. Something you'll see something get into some conversation that's that'll knock you one percent out of your comfort zone. So that's how I get my ideas. I think it's it's totally random, but there is a way to make sure that randomness works in my favor, and that is by you know, getting out there. That's good advice. Um, yeah, you're kind of, I don't know how the best way to say this, completely under the radar as far as I knew when it comes to weird fiction. In other words, there's this weird fiction crowd and your name hasn't really come up in conjunction with it. And I thought, I listened to your stories and I thought, here's this guy writing what I think is the epitome of weird fiction. And you know, more people need to know about them. So that's what happens when you consign yourself to the, uh, the strange world of podcasting and you stay there <laughs> and you have the incredible distaste for uh, that market and marketing and so forth that I just, I've, I just never felt really comfortable with that. I like the fact that there's 10 to 15 people out there who really like the stuff. And that to me is, is a great reward. I don't really see the need for much else. I never, was never a fan of the, um, the query letters and the submissions process. Uh, it got there was nothing about that that is anything like how I imagined being a writer would be when I was eight years old. On some level, I just want to be back there pounding away on like this Underwood typewriter my mother had got at a garage sale, <laughs> taking the pages out, setting them down, and I was done. And that was it. That was what writing was to me. And I'm, I've always, I've never been happier than when I was in that little zone. Uh, everything else, as soon as I realized you could make money off of it, uh, something was lost forever as I became, for years, fixated on that and maybe trying to pursue that. And as soon as I left it behind, I became happy again. So I imagine it'll, it'll always be that way, dwelling in the corners and in the shadows. No, that's extremely interesting to me, Soren. Um, I feel much the same way in, in a lot of ways. Um, and one of my questions for you today was going to be, or is, what does, and you've partially answered it already, but what does success as a writer, as a podcaster mean to you? You know, why do you do it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really about, to me, I'm, I'm just very happy when I'm sitting and thinking of an idea that has just kind of taken hold, trying to hash out a plot. And then finally reaching that tipping point where, and you know, all of you know what this is like, where you realize, you know what, I'm going to finish this story. This is actually going to happen. This is not going to get consigned to the dustbin or some old notebook. And you know that you did it. You, you kind of did it right. Uh, that to me has always been the success. And then the beauty of podcasting is you can put it out there and people will find it. Uh, and as I see and as I get emails from people saying, you know, I, I like that story because it, it killed a three hour drive to Wilmington. That I think is fabulous. Or, you know, I was in detention. Uh, I threw a spitball at some kid and I, I listened to some story. I, I, I don't even know the title of it. Can you refresh, refresh my memory as to what the title of that was? I'm like, yes. Okay. That, that is awesome. So, uh, that's yeah, have me. you gotten I, an email I, like that? Someone who was in detention? <laughs> yes, absolutely. But uh, to me, that's what, <laughs> to me, I consider that kind of Great. a success. Of it, you know? I, don't, I don't really need anything more. I will take all the money in the world if it were thrown at me. In a second, I would sell out. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't feel the need to, 
to pursue it. It's just no fun. It's just not fun to me. You know? Soren, you mentioned before that uh, you mentioned your literary influences that are horror writers. Are there any non-horror writers? Uh, yeah, I like the the novelists that are truly coming at it from a a different direction. There was always a Kurt Vonnegut guy. Mm -hmm. um, boy, who else uh, novel wise? Um, big fan of a guy named J.G. Ballard. Probably know him. Uh, very unusual science fiction writer. Um, I used to like um, buying those old Del Rey sci-fi collections of the you know, year's best sci-fi oh, yeah. um i used to eat those up the old uh asimov stuff because he was just so good at plot just thinking of clever ideas um yeah i kind of bounced around in the in the non-horror realm um I, yeah that's actually it's actually a difficult question i like a lot of individual novels and works of non-fiction but actual individual writers i um I'm still wait. I'm always looking for someone to completely just blow me away with their style. It's, it's happening less and less now, and I'm turning more toward nonfiction for inspiration. I can get just as much inspiration and entertainment from a good history book as I can from a novel now, which is that's changed. That, that's different from how it used to be. Since we live in a visual age, you, you mentioned this um, scholastic version of Dracula. Were there any movies as a kid that sent you down the road to horror? Yeah, I think I've been more influenced by horror movies than in fiction itself. You know, I'm, I was always into all the all the classics. You know, I tried to watch The Exorcist for the first time when I was when I was nine. I got about ten minutes into it and I freaked out and ran for <laughs> it, and I never quite fully recovered from that. But uh, you know, all the old. You know, when I was 14, you know, suddenly there's video stores everywhere. And we used to run to the video store and rent every awful horror movie there was. And once in a while, something good would sneak through, like some of the old John Carpenter stuff. It was, it was amazing. I've um, always been a fan of uh, Werner Herzog, Nosferatu the Vampire, Dracula Connection there. Uh, you know, Evil Dead. I remember watching that when I was young and renting that for the first time. The George Romero stuff, the early, the first zombie trilogy that he did. Uh, never gets old for me. Um, uh, Jaws, of course, to me was uh, kind of a textbook lesson in suspense. And to this day, I think that the uh, USS Indianapolis scene from Jaws, maybe 50% of the reason I went into podcasting, because of that, that little nugget, that little, you know, a guy telling a story to two other guys on a boat somewhere for four minutes, no music, no dramatic cutaways, no nothing. Um, the, the power of that I still remember as being a huge influence. And I'm always looking for that in a, in a movie. That's really movie. interesting. Yeah, I'm always looking for those scenes because those, those are amazing to me. You know what that reminds me of is the scene in um, uh, that other John Carpenter movie. I'm blanking on it. The Ghost Story one, you guys, the one that I really like. The John uh, Carpenter ghost story? Um, yeah, the, the, the one that... The, the Fog, thank you. Oh, the okay. first scene of The Fog with John Houseman just telling that story. Yeah, yeah, actually there's two scenes in that movie. that The John Houseman one, and then you remember the scene where um, they're looking for his friend, him and... and uh, uh, what's your name? Are looking for his friend and they're waiting for the Coast Guard or whatever, and he tells the story of something that happened to his dad. Yes, yeah, and that was only like four sentences long, yeah. And then there's a scene in there yeah. where, where Hal Holbrook is sitting there just reading from a diary. Right. This, these entries. And that, I mean, that, that to me is just the essence of the greatness. You know, the knife point of horror, I think, never even gets close to that brilliant level of uh, reduction. Uh, there's still too much padding, really, uh, for a lot of the knife point stuff. That it, it, There's something about... The scenes like those that, are, that is so crystalline and, and pure and perfect that, uh, and I wish you know Hollywood would would remember that, how amazing those scenes can be. Uh, it's it's tough to find a good one nowadays. The the instinct, of course, for these people is always well we have to we have to make things visual. That's what people want. We've got to have a lot of cuts, and you no, know, we can't just have people telling things on screen. That's and I think and I I'll always disagree with that. 
Yeah. Um, I was wondering, do you, have you personally had any paranormal experiences or anything? No, no, it's killing me. It's killing me. Um, <laughs> it's killing you. Uh, I've nothing even close. Everything, I'm a big believer in, you know, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah, so me too. It's never happened to me that it was odd, really does have a, an explanation. Even things that, uh, I, I moved into this new apartment recently and, um, there was a little bit of an incident where I hung the shower curtain rings, left the room for five minutes, and when I came back, I was confused because they had all flipped, all of them, all 12 of them. And as much as I would love to believe that I had a little poltergeist friend welcoming to the apartment, <laughs> I know that, of course, what happened is I, my, I'm remembering them the wrong alignment or something like that. So, or... Um, I've had strange things, you know, pre-dawn where you don't know if you're asleep or you're awake. If you sense something, you have a dream that seems real. Now, there's nothing I can, I can say was actually supernatural. And I've never known anyone who I really trusted who had an experience like that. And just once, I would like someone to look me in the eyes, someone I really trust, and tell me something and just have that moment of belief. Um, and I've never, I'm still looking for that moment. Well, Mike can tell you the story about the shadow person. Oh, uh, yeah. Shadow, per, uh, shadow people are good. Hit it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I don't have an explanation for it. So, you know, in that sense, it reminds me of weird fiction. But my wife and I were um, driving back from a wedding late at night. This has been like 15 years ago. And this two-lane road, <clears throat> excuse me, in the middle of the night, no other cars behind us or passing, you know, woods on either side of the, of the road and just driving along. And then all of a sudden this, what looked like a two dimensional upright shadow. Like if you picture a person running, mm -hmm. except it was one dimensional or excuse me, two dimensional from the right side of the road to the left side of the road, just very quickly. You both saw it. Yeah, we both saw it. Uh, that's that's the thing. You know what makes that scary is that it didn't do anything; it just was. Right. Uh, that's 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 pretty creepy. And what makes it creepy is that you don't. There's no explanation. You don't know what it is. Right. You know, because, if you, if you came up with an explanation like there's this creature that no one's ever heard of, but then it was Pat. You you happen to see it going across the road, and that's what it is. Suddenly, it's a lot less creepy. Exactly. It has it has a cause and effect going. Yeah. Right. Everything has no cause, no and almost barely an effect. And then it yeah, and plus you throw in some good atmosphere there, you got the country road at night. Yeah, that's yes. that's and the fact that it was two it wasn't even full dimensional, just two. Almost like it was yeah. some kind of cut out image. That's um uh, so what, how long ago was that? About fifteen years ago. Mm. And, That's you know, weird. just there's a part of my brain that just loves that stuff because I love weird fiction. Right. And the other part of my brain that says, well, this happened, does I don't, just because I can't explain it doesn't mean that it was necessarily paranormal. Right, right. But there's, I can tell you one thing for sure, it was yeah. weird. Right, right. Yeah, the closest I think I've come is I've had incidents of deja vu that have gone on for it feels like two minutes or more where I get the sense of deja vu and then everything that happens after I acknowledge that in my mind seems to make sense. Like, yeah, you know what? That, that, that makes sense too. That person walking by in the red shirt, yes. That makes perfect sense. I have a feeling about that too. Now, that in itself is probably explainable. But that's about as close as I've come. Um, a couple of years ago, I was uh, lying alone in a motel room late at night. And this was about a week after a friend's uh, beloved cat had passed away. I really liked that cat. And I was lying, and it was kind of pre-dawn, and I was between sleep and waking, and I felt little feet on the bedspread. And you hear that little tapping sound of a small animal when it gets on the bedspread. And I was so tired, I thought, oh, it's just some cat. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pet it later. Um, and one by one, the feet came up towards me. My eyes were closed, 
and then it stopped and then that settling of a warm body on your chest uh, and of course I woke up at like 8 in the morning and the dawn light was coming through and, and I thought well you know it, it was just one of those things where you're caught midway between sleep and wakefulness and that's what caused that but I like to think that if if I had a supernatural experience well you know what maybe that was something maybe there's the ghost of the cat come to say howdy in a very benign way I hope to God if I ever had one of these experiences it's it's, it's like that. Well, as long as we're discussing paranormal, possibly paranormal experiences, yes, Pete, you got to tell yours. Stop shaking your head. What? No. Yeah. <laughs> do it. Do it. Yeah, you do. What? what wait. So which Sorna one, love this. What are you? Which one are you talking about? Uh, with the, one? the oh lake. My God. No, the the creek one. Oh, the creek. Yeah. So, um, when I was in college, we had there was this huge botanical garden on on the campus and a bunch of us used to go out and you could get to this one place that overlooked the river um where they had built a little you know um hut whatnot and you can just sit around and and talk and and whatnot and uh so we would we would go there at night and um i got tired for waiting at we, we were all supposed to meet outside and go in together and I got tired of for waiting everybody so I went in and I went one way because I liked going that way and I got finally got to where we were supposed to be and everyone had beaten me there and I was like whoa wait a minute I left way before you guys and they're like yeah we waited for you like for 20 minutes and you know you never showed up and I was like well no I waited for you guys but meanwhile, they're like all looking at me. It's like, how'd you get here? And I said, I came the, the long way across the bridge. And they said, no, you didn't. So yeah, I did. I came the long way across, past the fountain across the bridge. And they dragged me back there and they showed me that the bridge was out. Uh, that the that maintenance had come and removed all these boards. And there's just no there was no way across that bridge anymore. But you had a memory of, of the that's memory. the way I can't I didn't you know, I didn't even think about I didn't even think about it, you know, just, just, it's just, I don't have a memory of not going that way. It's just, you walked one way and you got there and yeah. So it's kind of weird. That's like the, one of the weirdest things that ever happened to me. Well, see, now there we have, we have two stories there, three stories there. We were, we just weren't, we weren't, we weren't working from, from any script, right? Just off the cuff. And yet and they were 45 seconds long. And those to me are as powerful as anything that I may have spent six weeks writing uh, and they go on for pages and pages and pages. And that's, that's why I think storytelling has evolved with technology and so forth. But in the end, it doesn't get any better than what you just did. You know, that's, that's riveting stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun because, you know, you can dress things up and you can – and you can use all these little video tricks and audio tricks, but when it comes down to it, it's really just good storytelling. Right. And right. you've got to find that first. And it takes um, eight seconds. <laughs> yeah. I, saw, I, like the thing, I saw a tweet from some guy who said, oh, I just put my son to bed, and he said, Daddy, who's that man standing behind you? Right. I was like, okay, that was like 18 words, and I'm creeped out. Right. Uh, it's, it's just it's really amazing. So I, I dream of – I wish I could put together a book well, I mean, this is why something like creepy pasta, you know, is is so great because uh, it's just now we have a whole community of people uh, doing that kind of thing. Yeah, have you read any of those one to two line creepy pastas? Those are the only ones I read, actually. Yeah. Because uh, when, as soon as it gets longer, then it's like, well, that's kind of what I do, and I don't want to read this kind of stuff that I do. <laughs> what I want is the ultimate um, reductive experience. I remember one of my favorite short stories growing up was. Uh, Mark Twain wrote uh, Diary of Adam and Eve, I think it's called. It's just a nice little um, diary-based story. And he, he's, but the, the entire emotion of the story is summed up in one line at the end. He has one line where he put all the emotion. Uh, and I was always trying to chase something like that. And I thought, wow, how, how did he do that? How did he do that? Um, so it, it can be just done so swiftly and perfectly if you have the skill to do it. 
there's there's one that I can remember that I, I think it's from Ramsey Campbell's daughter. I could be wrong, and so don't quote me on that one. But it's it's a two a two line horror story. It's yeah. when I'm dead, I'll be hungry. You know, it's, uh-huh. yeah, it's and and the thing yeah. is, I will prob that line will probably surface in my brain randomly three years from now. Right, right. But the six or so horror movies I watched, uh, I want to want to binge lately. Um, I will not remember a single scene from, from those. No, it's 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 crazy. Storytelling is is it's such an art, I guess. It's it's really weird. I uh, my last novel, Reanimatrix, had a scene in it. Um that I apparently lifted completely from um, a horror comedy with uh, Bruce Willis about, you know, I, I can't even remember what it's called. Right. Um, oh, um, Death Becomes Her. Wow. Oh, yeah. That that movie. <laughs> and I just, and I wrote it and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm really, really proud of it. And I was like, and I was like, after the book comes out, I'm like, oh, crap. But, you know, it's like like a, like a like a chord progression from a from a song. You know, there yeah. people duplicate each other's chord progressions all this all, all the time. But you know, you, the way you wrote it in Random Matrix, different, tone, different, different everything. That's you know, yeah. I'm, I'm always you... I'm accidentally going to um, come up with what I think is a great original idea, not realizing that my subconscious has planted it because I saw it in some movie or um, the story I was about to release right now has a has a certain scene in it and it kind of bugs me because i'm like you know i think this is not as original an image as i think it is and i'll never know if it is or not uh but that mental recycling uh, it's kind of disturbing when you know it's going on behind the scenes of your own brain and there's you know, not much you can't catch it you guys remember when we had Stephen graham jones on and he's he unabashedly says, I got this from here. I, he's a great writer, mm-hmm. absolutely fabulous writer. You know, he says things like, I got this scene from here, and I got I picked up this idea from here. You know, he makes no bones about it. Sure. Yeah, well, it's all. But it's his spin on it. That's, that's the important thing. Sure. I always like the, uh, the uh, Stephen King uh, line that he had in uh, different seasons. It is, the, it is the tale, not he who tells it. And I always remember that. I thought, yeah, that's you know, if that's why I put um, put these stories out on the, the very liberal Creative Commons license, I don't mind if people remix stuff that I've written for their own purposes. Go ahead. I say, you know, it. it I'm not sure I ever actually created anything truly original. It's it's just bits and pieces of what everyone else has done. Images from the books I've read, the movies I've seen. So why not let people just go to town on it? Would you, without spoilers, would you mind giving us the synopsis of, you know, just several of the um, stories on the podcast? Uh, yeah, I think the one that people write in most often about, the one called Staircase, which you know about, mm-hmm. uh, kind of sums up what I've always tried to do, which is kind of attack the, the primal fears that everyone has. It's, it's easy prey. So for that one, it's very—it's about a half an hour long. Um, guy hears a creak in the middle of the night, uh, and then slowly the rest of the story is him realizing that that creak was maybe not so random, maybe did have an explanation. And when he realizes that it does have an explanation, he realizes at the worst possible moment when he is extremely vulnerable and can't do anything about it. Um, another one that people write in about was one of the rare instances in which I didn't have any idea going in. I simply decided that I wanted to try to write the scariest thing I possibly could with no foundation. I said, you know what, I'm going to sit down and just and just reach for it. It was called Possession. Um, it's a story of a, a guy who's fading mentally deeper and deeper into, into depression. And his life, is beca- everything is becoming dark around him. And then at some point, it it gets cranked up a notch on him, let's just say that. And he gets caught in something that's so, so dark that what he thought was darkness is just, you know, not even close. Um, 
Another one recently, a uh, fairly popular one is called Sisters, about um, uh, set in the um, about 300 years ago, I I believe. Uh, some strange goings on in a um, in a monastery in a very in, a, in the wilderness. Again, you know, I have a, a fondness for creating very remote atmospheres. So you know, nothing can be more remote than um, a bunch of nuns living out in the middle of the wilderness, and then they just word comes down the line that something has gone wrong. Something has gone very wrong uh, where these sisters live. Um, and in the story, it's it's very difficult to piece together what, what that is because of lack of information, which I really like putting in there. And it's, you know, lines of communication are, are bad, there's a blizzard, but someone begins to suspect these, these poor, pious women are in deep, deep trouble in the middle. And uh, the rest of it is a guy, he, he goes out there and what he finds, of course, is something just absolutely horrifying. But uh, there's uh, lots of common threads in the stories, but most of them are about one person uh, finding him or her him, himself um, in a situation where slowly control is lost, communication is lost, uh, and eventually they come up with against you know unspeakable things for which there is no solution. It's usually something you can't just stab your way out of, shoot your way out of. Uh, there's a sense of oppressive awfulness, um, borrowed probably from Lovecraft over the years. The sense that, you know what, you're never getting out of this. You can kill this thing that's haunting you, but that's you're still going to be screwed. I think that's the common theme. Yeah, I don't want to say why, but several uh, there were several things in the story fields that reminded me of Lovecraft. Yeah, yeah. Were you going to say something, Pete? Yeah, well, there's there's several repeating images, so to speak. There's the 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 vulture appears in multiple stories, um, or a large bird approaching someone appeals in, in multiple stories. Um, the blizzard, the being cut off from people by the blizzard, um, and and uh, you know the the singing the singers of songs from. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and and then then their effect on sort of this bizarre uh, all female religious group. Mm -hmm. You know, these are things that keep showing up in different pieces of your work. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting that you should mention the bird thing because yeah, I hadn't realized that. And now it's starting to make sense. What's up with that? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think I think it's because. Um, you know, the, the foundation is always the primal fears. Find, what, what are the primal fears? What are the things that scared people 5,000 years ago and continue to scare them today? And I think as long as you stick to that, it's tough to go way too far wrong in a, in a real horror story. Okay. You know, the knock at the door in the middle of the night, the realization that the phone lines are down, um, being in a room with someone at the moment you're, when you realize that they do not have your best interest at heart suddenly, that this person is not who you thought they were, these things never stop being scary. So I think I tend to repeat myself because I, I tend to cling so hard to that kind of thing. Well, I, I don't think it's a – you're not repeating yourself, but there are some very definite motifs that seem to – you've hit on that seem to terrify, if not you, then your readers. Yeah, certain certain visual images from my life, I think, you know, in, in all our lives, they they hit and then they stick. Right. The, the headlights on a country road in the middle of the night, I've, I've never been able to experience that without getting creeped out. And you'll see that pop up over and over and over again. You know, a flashlight going on in a, uh, in a dark room, what it sees in that little circle of light, mm -hmm. emphasizing the fact that you can't see everything else. Uh yeah, uh, even even nature. You know, nature to me often in winter seems so cold and unfeeling and harsh. Um, a nasty looking tree will creep me out. It uh, yeah. barren. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Or I mean, even you know, an animal, um, an animal, a, a great bird walking through a field in summertime when people are out and throwing a volleyball around. It's that's lovely, and then in winter it changes. 
when everyone's gone, that bird is does not seem right somehow. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. The, the little visual things um, do kind of haunt me. Keep coming back. In, in fields and apparently other stories, according to Pete here, he used this concept of a song affecting women. Is that sort of a reversal of the siren song that normally affects men in mythology? Uh, no, that probably give me too much credit for being clever. Uh, I think the the women thing was a very uh, very late addition, um, caused in part. There's a bit of a butterfly effect. I changed the gender of one of the characters uh, very late, and that in turn led to me needing um, some little extra touch toward the end. And that, that led to the concept of. <coughs> Uh, this, uh, this mysterious force using uh, I thought, well, what if it just what if it just used the women and maybe uh, so maybe the, the end of the story seems a little bit creepier because you realize all along that that's been going on so it wasn't wasn't a whole lot of conscious thought there until the very end I was over, I, I felt kind of backed into that little wrinkle in fact since we've mentioned fields several times can you Briefly summarize that plot too for the listeners. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it starts out as kind of a simplistic story of uh, uh, one of these uh, anonymous psychic researchers. Maybe um, starts to do some some looking around. He, he he says, you know, there's this this totally anonymous tract of land that is just for some reason things are not right here, and things have happened in the past that are just not right. So of course, the logical thing is we're gonna we're gonna camp out there and see what happens. It's kind of the beginning of, of a lot of um, horror stories, the the, the so-called bad place that we have to check into. Um, then this actually a flashing back in time, uh, and what you begin to realize is that yeah, this this place has always been one of those quote unquote bad places, and it's bad for reasons you don't quite know why it doesn't quite make sense there's a lot of the evidence maybe it was some kind of um maybe it's some kind of supernatural force maybe it's and, and then uh, of course the poor people who go inve and investigate uh fall prey to a lot of very unpleasant things um but in in essence it's just kind of a haunted house story um but i have always found you know driving past those long vast desolate fields, you know, when the sun hits them just right late in the day. Always finds that, uh, always found that kind of appealing. And then all it took was seeing the right field at the right time to generate some some real ideas. Soren, on that note, did you ever read the, uh, you mentioned you're a fan of Stephen King. Have you read his short story, N? Oh, which one? I'm sorry. It's N, just the letter N, followed by a period. Um, I'm sure I did. That was one of his most, in one of his most recent collections, right? Yeah. Uh, Rick, I think you probably summarized this better than I can. We've talked about this several times. You want to do that? You're you're muted. It's a it's about a field of stones where there is some presence, which is causing people, I think, to either commit suicide or it's about, it's kind of like an island that the guy has to to take a little boat to. No, uh, different, different okay. story. No, it's. I think. I think the, it starts out. It, it, it happens to a woman's brother, and it happens to her. Yeah, if I remember I the story correctly. I'm sure. I which, read it. Do you remember which collection that was in, Rick? It's one of the more. It's, it's one of the more recent ones. Yeah. It's also I read it, I'm getting it confused with something else. Yeah. It's it's available as a standalone graphic novel, but. Mm -hmm. One of the neatest ways to watch it is it's a series of like 25 two-minute shorts um, with music and uh, spoken dialogue on YouTube using the images from the comic book. Yeah, except let me let me jump in there and say you're right. That, that is fabulous. But my favorite version of the story, and I think I'm guessing would be yours, Soren, since you're into what you're into mm -hmm. is the uh, audiobook version. Yeah. Uh, it's read by through, it's very, very, very well done. Um, I, I cannot, from what I can tell of you so far that you like, 
what you've mentioned that you like. I cannot recommend that highly enough. Wow, I've, I gotta check it out from the library again because I, I bet you I read it and I'm just uh, conflating it with other stuff. What do you guys think in general the the graphic novel format? I mean, are you? I'm, I've always been disappointed that it hasn't been hasn't penetrated or done extraordinarily well enough to. Um, you know, really take over. Uh, apparently, someone told me that in France, graphic novels are extremely popular. Um, yeah, with Mobi uh, Mobius uh, and uh, a few other things like uh, Tintin, mm -hmm. right. very popular um, in France and I think in Europe in general. Uh, not so much uh, as frowned on as it is in here. But in the same can be true as, as in Japan. Yeah, I, I would love to to actually do one from scratch. Uh, the, the cost is um, still a little bit prohibitive, but I think uh, you know for horror it can work so well. You know, get a nice nice black and white vibe going on. And uh, yep. I'm always looking around. I used to um, read like you know weird tales or um, eerie comics, which is still uh, printing actually. Um, Always had a fondness, for, you know, Tales of the Unexpected comic books. Uh, always had a big fondness for those. They, you can only, I always thought you could only get so suspenseful with a comic book, in a graphic novel format, because uh, the, the pacing is a little bit tough to work with. It's tough to slow people down uh, to, the, to the, the rate that you want them to go. But uh, I've, I've always thought that uh, somewhere out there, maybe someone is going to do just a, well, also, you have the same potential uh, pitfall as a movie, where you don't want to show too much, really. Right, right. Yeah, I'm. Uh, so I want someone to come up to me one day and say, "You know, there I finally found a graphic novel uh, horror, the horror genre that is just absolute, absolutely terrifying and a masterpiece." Um, sometimes I'll. Uh, I'll see an art style that's you know, wow. That's that's the art style that would really work incredibly well. But of course, it doesn't quite match up with a great story. So, still waiting. Still waiting. Um, one of my panelists who isn't here today wanted me to pass on a question. S. P. Muskowski wants to know. Uh, she says, "Did he learn narrative structure by taking a writing class or by paying close attention?" To the way fiction he liked was constructed, and then emulating and experimenting with that. Yeah, I think up until the time I was 18 or so, what I wrote was was really just um, copying structures that I'd seen that worked. Um, I remember when they would assign us books in high school, you know, sometimes you would just um, take notice of a certain paragraph or a certain line, um, or even the way, I forget who the writer was, but, you know, uh, the trick of, having a single sentence paragraph in the middle of bulkier paragraphs and, and the, the, just how that worked. Um, a, another novel taught me, oh, the, the brilliance of the, um, is it called an epigraph? Or, you know, you take a few lines from a poem or a song. Right. Lead off with that to set the, to set the mood and have something in the reader's mind. You know, I'd steal that. Okay, that, now I've learned that. So it was all, I never took a, um, any writing courses? It's all imitation and uh, recreation, I think. and just uh, taking little bits and pieces from everything, from movies to books to uh, you know even TV shows, and, and mashing them up. Uh, any more questions for Soren, guys? Uh, what are you working on now, Soren? What's next for you? Uh, I tried to go a few months without thinking of um, anything suspenseful or supernatural, and I, it was funny. And my mind felt very free, and I was happy and, uh, in my little retirement. And then I realized I had nothing. My mind couldn't latch on to anything, and I just I started to very quickly miss the challenge of writing new stories. So the Knife Point Horror Podcast is is um, I'm creating new new stories for that. I should have another one in a couple of days. Uh, and you know that feeling is now back of you know climbing that mountain, coming up with the germ of an idea, and just just trying to slowly hack away at it until I have something. I realized that I may not be able to 
go without that challenge for very long without becoming uh, sad. So that is what I'm working on currently. We're going back to creating those stories. And uh, we'll see what's next. Well, now that you're back in the saddle, what on average, uh, and the last thing I'd want you to do is rush, obviously, but having said that, on average, how many, about how many stories are you releasing, you know, like every six months, every year? Uh, I never quite know. I imagine I can, I can do three or four good stories per year. And beyond that, I don't think it'd be diminishing returns. I think if I tried to accelerate things, um, as it is after I write this, release this next story, I got nothing in the tank. I got the, uh, a page of random ideas for something very long, uh, Kind of, I, I refer to it as feature length. We're talking, you know, 90 minutes, fully plotted, um, kind of very movie-ish, as much as movie-ish as I can make these things. Uh, but that's going to take a while. Uh, so I could go dark for another period of months. But if I ever, if I was ever able to do six of these a year, I'd be amazed, amazed with myself. Well, I thought you had very good advice for when you are not inspired to do something different, you know, anything different, get out of your rut, get out of your routine. Yeah. For me, that's called the NFL season. Um, <laughs> I start to watch football and I thought, Oh, you know, I haven't written anything in like 12 weeks. Uh, and I think my mind may need that respite. So if I go dark during that time, you'll know it's because the, you know, there's a, a good NFC East uh, thing going. <laughs> All right. Well, the priorities in this life. So, well, Thanks for being on the show, Soren. It's wonderful yeah. talking to you. Appreciate it. Really yeah. enjoy your podcast. Uh, we're going to talk for a few more minutes about a few other things. You're welcome to stay or leave, whichever is best for you. Hear some stuff. All right. Talk some trash. Yeah. Uh, here, well, you, you're great. You're just in time for the commercial. I uh, just want to remind everybody about the Patreon. That's what helps me keep this thing going. So the link is in the podcast description or in the YouTube description, depending depending on how you're listening to this show. Or you can just Google Lovecraft Easy and Patreon. And plus, you get additional content. You get the Lovecraftian Tales fiction podcast, and then you get another nonfiction podcast occasional. Once or twice a month is what we're shooting for on that. So Kelly and I already did one of those, and I'm trying to talk Rick and Pete into doing one soon. You got the email. Don't act like you didn't get the email, Pete. Well, I responded to your email. <laughs> Now, there is something coming up for the Patreons. Um, aren't we going yes. to get together and have dinner at Necronomicon? Uh, well, I'll let Pete talk about that. He organized the whole thing. So, yeah, I'm thinking that... All right, so in the Necronomicon Hotel, there's a McCormick and Schmicks. Um, I am a member of their parent company. So, literally, I can walk in with a 1,000 people, and they put me to the front of the line. Um, we're not... We're not going to do that, but I was thinking that as a if if there are Patreon members who are going to Necronomicon, that would be kind of fun to to do a sort of Patreon exclusive dinner, um, maybe like at eight, nine o'clock at night on on Friday, and uh, you know just treat you guys treat you guys to a, a, a sit down with Mike and and whoever else shows up. So Try like, not to look at it as a punishment. Yeah. So yeah. It's like it's like second dinner. That's it, it, it second breakfast. Second dinner. Yes. Absolutely. Um, you know, I because of of certain factors in my life, I have to, you know, moderate but eat properly. Old and, age is that what you're talking about? Yeah, old age. Yes. And uh, I can't I can't have dinner at five o'clock and not have a snack till six o'clock in the morning. So yeah, I'm going to have to have a late night dinner. Soren, and for those listening who don't know, we're talking about the Lovecraft convention. Um, third week in August, 17th through the 20th. Yeah. Where is it? Necronomicon Where is it? In Providence. Providence. Oh, perfect. Right. So not yeah, too, they, not they, really they, relatively speaking too far from you. No, they've not opened up the uh, tickets for the prayer breakfast yet. I've noticed. You no. keep complaining to me as if I have pull. No, I'm just, I'm just saying it's like I think it's like uh, it's all just sort of rushing to a head because it's like about six weeks from now, right? 
you know what I would do? I would send Niels a very stern email and with a lot of caps and exclamation points. And, and, and see what that gets you. Yeah, see yeah. what happens. Well, when you say prayer breakfast, is it people praying to Cthulhu or is it? Oh, God. Oh, it's, it's so much more. <laughs> <laughs> we, we pray to Yak so thought. All right. It's this comedy thing that a guy named Cody Goodfellow does. Mm -hmm. We, we, we worked at the Ark Sosats with uh, water bubbles. I, I, I think believe you would prefer it. <laughs> but we're not a cult. That's what they all say. That's just what you'd say if you were a cult. It's exactly what every cult says. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and, and if – I don't know. So one of the things I did last year was I did this whole trivia thing. And I don't know whether I'm, I'm going to be able to do that again at Necronomicon. But if I don't do it at Necronomicon as a whole, I will do it at the dinner. All right. Well, we'll need so, something to talk about. Exactly. So I, last year's theme was like um, Herbert West. I think this. Oh, shocker. Yeah. Because it's like you, you, this year might be, I don't know, uh, Cthulhu porn. Um. Oh please! Uh -oh. <laughs> you know that's got to exist somewhere. It's oh yeah! Oh, it does. It's, 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 there, it's everywhere. It's booty call. Well, I've heard it anyway. it's, uh, hmm. There's Thanks, call internet. Call <laughs> yeah, you know it won't really be Cthulhu porn, but you know it'll be. There will be a theme. Pete, you've been accused of writing Cthulhu porn. Uh twice. Uh, for yeah. Yes. Well, something called the reanimation. I don't know who said that. Didn't know what they were talking about. So yeah. Well, yes. Reanimatrix has a healthy dose of well. Uh, there's a in reanimatrix. There's a subtext. Um, there are two characters. Surprise. There are lots of characters, but the two main characters. One is very outspoken about her sexuality, and the other one uh, is not, and it creates some conflict between the two of them. Um, but some people did not like the outspoken bits. Uh. Um, it's okay. Everybody's a critic. Exactly. Well, it's more R than NC-17, right? Uh, I was, yeah, yeah. I would go with an R. Maybe, and maybe it's an NC-17, but yeah, who knows? Yeah. I, I, just, I just write it. I don't rate it. <laughs> well, the the other angle was using Ramsey Campbell's idea that the yes. Lovecraftian entities would use pornography to attract people. Yes, that and that you know. So in uh, what was the collection? Uh, the Children of Glaki, Glaki. Sorry, I got to get the 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 umlaut or whatever it is in there. Uh, my story um, deals with the slow corruption of a book collector who desperately wants a very rare piece of mythos literature and is willing to do just about anything to get it. It wasn't slow, was it? I mean, <laughs> no, well, it was one day, but it was a long day. And Matt's gone again. With a rapid descent into uh, pornographic madness. Yeah, it, yes. But, you know, the problem is that you, you can write that story – and you can keep it clean and just mm -hmm. sent into, into some sort of madness. Or what I was really riffing off of was, you know, um, cold, uh, Campbell's cold print. Right. Um, and I'm sorry if people don't like that, but, you know, it, it sort of was everything that, that Campbell wrote about in the, what was it, 60s or 70s? Yeah. Um, just a little bit updated. And well, I, I was saying it was true to the spirit of stuff Campbell had done in the Campbell Tribune anthology. So, it wasn't like you. like you and I both know the controversy was Philip was a former writing Tarzan and Doc Savage past issues which have loads of sex. Right. Which, which right. were not in the original source material, but with Campbell, you have it in the original source material. Right. And that, Matt just looks creepy. <laughs> there now his picture. Yeah, now it's just like as soon that. as you said that. Yeah. 
it, so have you guys have read this or looked at this uh, new anthology tales from the Miskatonic University Library? I have. I have it. It's the book I'm reading right now, but I've only through one story. Did you read the introductions? Uh, no, I did not. Uh, read the John Ashmead introduction, the first introduction. Okay. Of the book. So I, I, we talked about this book. Just I briefly mentioned it a few weeks ago and said, hey, this is a new book. Check it out. I haven't read it. So it's, it's available on Kindle Unlimited. So I, I picked it up. And I'm reading the introduction, and I get down to the end of the introduction, and there's a footnote. And the footnote says, <laughs> this hits me out just out of the blue. The footnote says, most notably, the Lovecraft e-zine hosted by Mike Davis. Very highly recommended. I'm like, what? <laughs> what, what did I miss? And went back and finally found the where reference. It was coming from, the reference, yeah. And it was... Uh, they were he, John Ashmey was talking about online forums, I guess. So, well, let me, let me ask you guys this question: If I'm if I'm a guy like guy like me is looking for an anthology written not by Lovecraft but by others inspired by him, what is there one that is what is the the most faithful to his his vibe and his style? Now, see, the thing is, this is not a simple question. <laughs> We go through this all the time. It's like, damn you, Soren. There's, well, it's, it's like, there's roughly, since, especially since 2009, it's just a volcanic flow. But right. There, and the reason I ask is, is like the flow has gotten so ridiculous. I don't even know. Well, why, why don't you start with like, just get the Book of Cthulhu, and it's uh, not quite a greatest hits, but it sort of is, and that'll give you uh, some of the best stories that have been written in the uh, genre in the last, say, 10 years or so. Cool. And it's a nice jumping off point. Yeah. You, you, you get it in a big whether you're looking for Lovecraft as uh, as as the stories, as the Minnesota stories have evolved into modern literature as opposed to... Pastiche. That's yes. a pastiche. Well, the writers of the time, you know, he was part of a circle of writers who were interacting with him and being influenced by Lovecraft and influencing Lovecraft at the same time. And see, my problem is a lot of those older stories are what was acceptable to be written into an anthology then doesn't quite work anymore. And I find the, the, the creativity and the talent of the authors who are currently involved in the genre is generally of a much higher level of quality. Right. So, so it's like if you go to if, – if you don't want to, like, do what Rick says and kind of delve into it historically and comprehensively like us idiots, it's like <laughs> you want to pick just a, a few of the more mo uh, recent books. Like I think uh, a collection by Laird Barron would be a nice jumping-off point. Yeah, Mike told me about that one. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned that too. Well, something like, well, the, the – the last Arkham House version of Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos. Mm, the Golden Age? W w w was, Golden a good anniversary mixture, was a good mixture of old stuff and more modern stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So you get, you know, Ramsey Campbell's called Print. Mm -hmm. Dick Lupas, Tales from the Gorgon. Probably the simple answer to this question, but that's okay. So, so it's what you're looking for. When you say, when you say what's true to Lovecraft, well, is it what Lovecraft wrote then, or what Lovecraft would be writing now if he was part of a of the current literary movement? But or even right. more so, like what have people done with uh, cosmic horror lately? You know, the, the the children of Lovecraft, as it were. Yeah, to me, there's two different branches. Soren, there's 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 Lovecraftian pastiche, which there's some great Lovecraftian pastiche. Or there's, you know, cosmic horror stories that aren't that aren't pastiche that are just they're more about the cosmic horror, you know, right, right, and the weird fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, there's a so, couple of good jumping off points there. I gotta I gotta look into that stuff because I do have a fondness for, you know, um, original original flavor, uh, Lovecraft, as it were. You know, I've, right. I've read some some stories of you know the the evolution of it and people putting their own spin, but sometimes. Uh, 
I think it can be a real challenge. Say, so you know what? It's it's 1924. You don't know what the next 80 years of fiction brought. So simulate, you know, do a simulation of the Lovecraft style. I think it'd be kind of a. I, I wanted to try that someday, um, just as a little personal challenge. But it's you know it's tougher tougher than it, it even seems. I'd check out Autumn Cthulhu if I were you. But. It's a great choice. It's not just being <laughs> self-serving, Mike. It's a great oh, choice. Oh, thanks. Well, I shall do that. There's some really good ones. And, 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 you know, I meant what I said before. From what it sounds like your interests are, the type of mood and atmosphere that you're interested in, Soren, I would definitely check out Laird Barron, both his collections and um, his novels. Yeah, the phone is brilliant. Oh yeah, and I think it's a question of mood and atmosphere versus do you want to learn more about the Lovecraftian mythology, which is a whole different uh, angle to understand. Right. Well, I don't. I don't want to get too Silmarillion with the whole <laughs> Lovecraft thing. You know, the the world creation. Because you know, I always thought the less I know about it, the better. Really, but uh, agreed. Yeah. Yeah. The less I wish I knew less. Actually, that almost leads into another question I did want to squeeze in. Um, is that, uh, you know, they, they bandy about uh, some director is attached to adapt this Lovecraft story, this or that. And I personally shake my head a little bit when I read that because I don't think anyone is ever going to get it cinematically. I think they're always going to miss the point. Um, you know, in the age of CGI, the, the temptation to entertain in that way is going to be too great. And any movie that is made is going to fall short and uh, not get the Lovecrafting vibe at all. I was just wondering if you guys agree with that. Can you foresee uh, some of I don't disagree. Comments. I, I don't disagree personally, but if you want, if you're just going for that Lovecraftian vibe, uh, there are some movies that have done it really well. The first that leaps to mind is, we've talk, talked about this on the show before, is Absentia. So. Uh, I would say The Thing by John Carpenter. In yeah, the Mouth of too. Madness by John Carpenter. Prince of Darkness by John Carpenter. Yeah. But do you think uh, someone is actually going to take an actual Lovecraft story? Yes. And really uh, nail it? Yes, actually. The H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. Ah. Um, that's that's done to They've, they've done a black and white silent version of the Call of Cthulhu. I saw that. That was that was pretty that was pretty interesting. Yeah. And then they also did a talkie black and white of um, the Whisper of Darkness. Darkness. Now yep. they changed the story around to make it work cinematically. Right. Right. And especially I thought the first two thirds of that building up, they made it a more uh, action packed ending. Um, but the first but the lead up to that was just brilliant you know so i thought yeah, the, the two movies were very different i noticed they 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 did a very different job with with both those stories well the, the first called cthulhu movie was very um was more raw of course with that uh, silent movie vibe and uh the whisper in darkness was more of a more of a you know an authentic you know 1927 you know movie movie uh, as it were it, it, it was like a universal horror movie exactly exactly I think maybe the key to these things is, you know, the less money someone has to make a Lovecraft movie, the better it's going to turn out. Because they, again, they can't show what they think people want to see. I talked to the director of Absentia, and he told me that um, one of the, I don't want to ruin anything at all, but the, one of the scariest scenes in the movie he did with a twig. Yeah, right. You know, because he was on a budget. Yep. And it was effective. It works, sure. So, yeah, but definitely do check out that one. I will. Just I, for that, I for that vibe. I can't believe it. I haven't heard of it. Cool. So, uh, all right. What else we got to talk about? Uh, Rick, I want to let you know that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 4 is now on Netflix. So, I'll, I'll, be, I'm a, I'm a, I'll watch it now. Yeah, you're going to love the last, uh, the last story cycle. All right. So, yeah, I missed it when it was on Hulu, and then I just saw that they put it on, on Netflix already. So I'll queue it up. This was unquestionably the best season of that show. Mm. 
Uh, all right, we have anything else to talk about? Do you guys see Wonder Woman? Wonder Woman's doing great. I I enjoyed Wonder Woman. Um, there were some problems with story arc, but you know, I I can live with it. It was a good movie. My kids loved it. Yeah, I, I liked it, but I always said you you have to believe that somehow Themyscira, Paradise Island, or whatever we call Wonder Woman's home these days, exists in the dimensional nexus, which opens on the Aegean Sea and the North Sea. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because somehow Steve Trevor is located right between Turkey and England. Yeah. Well, it is a magical island. Right. Magical, just like Tahiti. <laughs> but they could have explicitly said something like that, you know. It, it, it's just a superhero movie. It's like, I, I, I liked it well enough. I think it's getting way overhyped for what it is. You know, it's not like some great revelation. It was just a modest a movie. Marvel movie. I, I, I think it got overhyped for two reasons. First, it's the first truly good female superhero movie. And secondly, all the previous DC movies have been kind of uh, below expectations. So, it, you know, it, it gets it gets a higher rep for just being what, you know, it, it, I think if the earlier movies had been good, we would have said this, this, this is another good DC movie, rather than it's the greatest superhero movie ever made, which it isn't. Mm. Well, how about this? Uh, explain to me, if, and tell me if I'm missing something here. Yes. Because okay, thank you. All right, next topic. Uh, so in Man of Steel, Superman. Uh, spoiler alert: Superman kills Zod uh, because he really didn't have a choice. Zod was about to fry a family. Uh, Batman in Batman v Superman, Batman kills a bunch of bad guys, and they both get a lot of shit. On social media, you know, the public just hates the fact that Superman killed Zod. Hates the fact that Batman killed people in Batman v Superman, even though it's not unprecedented. Yeah. Uh, my question is: Wonder Woman killed people in in her movie. Where's all the backlash? They were not. I mean, what's? Huh? Yeah, but that bad guy is bad guy, they right? Weren't even Nazis were they? They know they no. were not Nazis. They were a little, little bit of hypocrisy saved them from on. becoming Nazis. So it's actually kind of, you know, a good thing. It was, it was a mercy. <laughs> well, you know, that, that, that German general actually exists, and they totally changed history. General Ludendorff. That's, that's a real general. Not that guy. <laughs> I, I, that I know, guy. but I'm just saying in the movie... Rather than getting killed by Wonder Woman in real life, he tried to overthrow uh, the government of Munich was Hitler in 1923. So my next thought was, well, okay, obvious answer, she's, a, she's fighting in a war. Except really, when you think about it, that breaks down too. Superman, if he wasn't in a war, what was he in when he's defending the earth from an invading Kryptonian army? I mean, if that's not war, what is? Well, how is Wonder Woman depicted in the comics these days? Because I get the impression from the from the just the last Justice League cartoon that I saw that they've made her more like Xena Warrior Princess, where she's more kill kill the enemy rather than uh, I'm just going to tie you up with my magic lasso and make you tell the truth. Ever since 2011, I think that's more true than not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in I there was a. Did you guys remember Kingdom Come? Oh yeah, God, that was a great yeah. graphic novel. She um she really stands out as you know the the warrior general in that in that book. You know, she's very clear. You know, when when the riot breaks out in in the prison, she's very clearly willing to kill people. And you know, all the other heroes are just looking at her like, what? But is, yeah, is, is that the influence of Xena, Warrior Princess? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, she's got the problem with Wonder. It's not the problem with Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman has changed dramatically um, over the course of the years, and right. I'm not sure that she she's not as established a character as Batman and Superman. And 
maybe that's part of her charm. And I, I kind of like that, that she has gone through different stages. And she's more mutable. Nobody ever says Wonder Woman doesn't kill. Wonder Woman is a war machine. I mean, that's that's what she does. You know, this is also one of yeah, the but in some adaptations, she's her mission is bring peace mm -hmm. through war. And not always. It depends on which version of her you're talking about. Yeah. Well, well, the other thing, this is the most Freudianly conceived comic that was ever created. Mm -hmm. The original creator was a psychiatrist. And we won't get into all the dominatrix angles of Wonder Woman. Yep. But there is a reason for the lasso and a lot of other stuff. Yeah, it's also, okay, okay, so she's charging very bravely uh, across no man's land. You know, when the Germans set up their trenches, they didn't set up, they set up crossfires, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Come on. They're not shooting straight, they're shooting from the sides, yeah. Yeah, so, come on. Well, never mind. This was what World War One was like on a parallel world. Okay. Matt. Let's just, there's your, yeah, there's your answer. Movie. It has some flaws. Right. But I enjoyed it. It's a popcorn movie. If, yeah, we, if we want to try to compare this to history, as I've already indicated, it was Ludendorff. You're going to find all sorts of weird things that didn't make sense historically. Look, I, I loved the movie. Um, I thought it was very well done. I just wanted to point out there's a bit of hypocrisy there with the, you know, it's okay for Wonder Woman to kill. It's not okay for, you know, when necessary. It's not okay for Batman or Superman to kill when necessary. Yeah, well, we're not going to get, you know, what I'm saying also, we're not going to get historical accuracy in any of these war films. I mean, I loved Captain America, the first Avenger, but that was in World War II. No. There's a question I wanted to ask you guys about superhero movies in general is that um, I get into a friendly argument with a guy uh, I know who's hugely into everything Marvel and DC and he's always he's trumpeting these movies as you know these are the these are the truly great movies and it's time that they get their due as you know cinematically mature and I say well my problem Matt is that I'm still waiting for someone to have the guts to make a ser superhero movie that doesn't end with a big fight scene. And I think that is when they will have truly arrived. When someone says, you know what, we don't have to end this in a big conflagration and kicking and thunderbolts and like, show me the superhero movie that actually dares to end quiet. Unbreakable? Well, True. Watchmen had a bit of a fight scene at the end, but it certainly wasn't. Right. Yeah, Watchmen didn't last for very long. A good example, but I, bet, I wonder if someone's going to say, you know, the the you know the Wonder Woman sequel, or the next Captain America movie, or Avengers. Nope, we're not going to end it with that kind of conflict. We're going to end it with either a mystery or some sort of um, argument or some kind of political wrangling or. Oh, hell no, that's not going to happen. Straight up drama. Do you think it could even be pulled off? I think no, anything could that. be pulled off, but will it happen? Probably not. Well, these movies are not made that way. They're made by the studios seeing a potential source of yeah. large amounts of revenue. Sure. And that's how they're developed. They're developed to be appealing to a broad audience and especially an overseas audience uh, with lots of life and cross-marketing and life in video and potential for sequels and convention fare. And yeah. this is not the same as... Uh, a director who's going for an artistic vision. Do you know what I mean? The director yeah, do, has do you to think the, the two will always be mutually exclusive. Do you think it's possible to combine those two things and, and really oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but I just I think that like to say that these are the epitome of cinematic art, it's like not hardly. You know, like is Transformers cinematic art? These things aren't that far removed from Transformers. In fact, uh, from what I'm reading, the, the latest Transformers movie should kill the franchise. That's well, what I've heard, too, yeah. Not that I've seen any of them, but except for the first one. I don't even remember that one. Are you yeah, eating nachos, one. Pete? Sorry? Are you eating nachos? <laughs> I am. So sometimes I'll, uh, I'll be watching one of these superhero movies, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm... I, 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 I like a good one once in a while, but I am sometimes struck 
at the skill that it takes to put one of these things together is equal to the skill it takes to put you know a, a straight drama of high acclaim together the the, the creativity and the uh, the editing mastery and the, the writing flair is is up there with with anything that i i've seen it's just the, the topics that they choose and then sometimes they will go for the you know the cliches the stereotypes that as you said yeah it makes people happy and that's what they want and it brings in a lot of money yeah i think there have there have been a bunch of of um lesser known here superhero movies um that i've really enjoyed that have, have gone down different directions mm. um, like what uh i liked hit girl there's a movie with uh Rain Wilson, um, where he just assumes the identity of uh, a, a Batman-like character, but I think it's in, if I remember correctly, it's in response to um, his wife leaving him. Um, What's the name of that movie? I can't remember what that one is called. Well, if you uh, think of it, email yeah. me. That sounds and interesting. Then there's one where... And I think it stars Alan Tudyk, but I could be wrong where he thinks he's a superhero, but he's re and he, that he has superpowers, but he really doesn't. And everything <laughs> goes his way until like the end. Is that a comedy? It's not a comedy. It's actually very, very sad. It, it, it reminds me a little bit of Mystery Men. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a great movie. Yeah. You say Mystery Men's a great movie, and I love Mystery Men because I find it campy and over the top. Right. And yet everybody involved with it has just owned it. And in fact, the people who did the music for it, you know, walked away from it as well. So. Well, I don't get that because I think it's a very funny, well done I think movie. It's a, I, I really enjoy that movie. I, I love the whole thing with the glasses. Is it? Yeah. Parody of Clark Kent and Superman. Hey, you want to hear my theory on why Superman is never confused for Clark Kent and vice versa? Sure. You remember at the end of Superman 2 when he hypnotizes Lois Lane? Yeah. Well, oh, yes. My theory is that he does, in all versions, he does that have this hypnotic ability, and he doesn't even know that he has it, really. It's just this sort of this subconscious thing, and people don't really notice that he's the same person. It's not so much the glasses as it is that. Because, you know, just me maybe, but I don't think glasses are an effective disguise. <laughs> so, I thought you were going to say it's because people have a subconscious desire to believe in that otherworldly superhero. And if they started to sense that Clark Kent and him were the same person, they would be disappointed on some level. So they don't want to see it. That too. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds a lot cleverer, so let's pretend I said that. Yeah, but well, that makes more psychological sense. But the, hip, the hypnosis thing is, is kind of an interesting tack. Like, it's just never brought up that, of course, that's, that's what he would do, really. That's logically what he would do is, look, i got to make sure, you know, there are certain physical limitations. People are going to start to see who I am, so therefore I have to do something on my own. Yeah, the, cloud. the vast majority of the world is affected by Kryptonian hypnosis. Well, you know, well, he, especially he, where does he work? My God, with a bunch of people who are their job is to f find out the truth. You know, well, well, the other thing is, even if you wear a mask, the way that it used to be done. I mean, like, if you knew, if you, if we go back to Adam West as Batman, if you knew Adam West as Bruce Wayne you, and knew him as Batman, you would know it's the same guy. Yeah. Sure, talks the well, same with him. But now, when they did, when Michael Keaton played Batman. That was when I really believed. I would not know that was that was Batman. The voice was different. The suit made him look bulkier. I was one of the best things about the Tim Burton Batman movie. They, they that's true, and he did not resort to the weird gravelly voice that Christian Bale resorted to. That's, that's a good point. Michael Keaton did it kind of more organically. Yeah. I had this idea about this guy who's desperate to figure out who um, Bruce Wayne, uh, who Batman is. So he just starts looking at cell phone records. <laughs> yeah, cell phones have destroyed a lot of plausibility things yeah. in fiction people used to be able to get away with. 
Well, how many people can be Batman? You either have to be insanely rich or be backed by somebody who is a, who's right. insanely rich. Right. You know? Well, you know, Ray Al Ghul figured out who Batman was just by tracing all these financial transactions involving whatever he needs to build the Batmobile or whatever. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, you know he's not doing all that work in the Batcave himself. No. <laughs> no. And which begs the question, how do all these workmen get there? How are they transported? Nobody says anything? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to assume they don't know where they are. Yeah. yeah or they've been crazy. paid so much that they would never breathe a word. No, they, they're just routinely paid for in labor. What? They're just routinely deported back to Guatemala. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Ow. oh, oh. Man. Damn. Bruce, Bruce is a callous billionaire. <laughs> oh. That, that sort of reminds me of Lovecraft where you had these disposable workers who were African slaves and boarded in case of Charles Dexter Ward. Oh, yeah. My favorite of all of the stories, by the way. My favorite. Yeah. All right. Uh, On prizes. That <laughs> prizes. We're giving away, uh, giving away, this is thanks to David Del Cole. We're giving away Whispers from the Abyss anthology. Edited by Cat Roca. Entertaining. Uh, yeah, and you're giving away, uh, what was it, Wolf Hunt 2? By Jeff Strand. Also a very entertaining novel. If you like werewolf things. All right. If you want to be put into the drawing for these, either be a Patreon member, by the way, you're automatically entered into the drawing, or send an email to Lovecraft Easing Prizes, Lovecraft Easing Prizes at gmail.com and put the um, title of the book in the subject of the email. And then I'll do a random drawing uh, about a week from now. So I save this for last. Rick, do we want to talk about the latest Doctor Who with spoilers so that everybody can leave who, has, who hasn't seen it? The, uh, all right, the, the cliffhanger one? Yeah, the cliffhanger one. Yeah, we can talk about that. All right. Do you watch Doctor Who, Pete? I don't remember. I just, you know what? I just finished watching the episode before. I came on. Because <laughs> you knew we'd talk about it. I suspected. All right. You've, you've been warned. We're going to talk about Doctor Who with spoilers. So leave if you don't want to get spoiled. So what did you think, Rick and Pete? I liked it. I would have liked it more if they hadn't spoiled the two big reveals. Yes. the villains even though it took me a long while to realize that that was the master. I mean, it was only very near the end that I realized it's uh, the previous master in disguise. Only when they, when they had the master and Missy together. You're thinking exactly the same thing I'm thinking. I wish they wouldn't do that. It would have been so much more effective. Yeah, because I, I would have been going, my God, is this, is this the origin of the Cybermen? When I knew that, you know, from the moment it began, this is the origin of the Cybermen. Yeah. And, you, and you knew that that the uh, master was going to show up. I, well, I was wondering if it was going to be in this episode or, 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 or just at the I didn't. I, I was surprised. I didn't catch that he was the guy with the beard until it became, you know, kind of very obvious when he was talking to Missy. Well, in the next time at the end of last week's, he appears very briefly. Not you. You wouldn't know it was that guy, but you know he's going to be in the episode if you catch that. Yeah, yeah, and I wish they hadn't have done that. Yeah, I yeah, 100% agree. Hundred percent agree. That should that should have been a huge, a huge secret. You know, if you're the writer of those of that episode, you're probably thinking the exact same thing. Well, yeah, you 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 spent all this. I think actually, I think it was written by Stephen Moffat. So, yeah, just, or was it? Well, well I think he's they, not. He's I don't know why he spoiled his own writing. Yeah. I think it's a question of trying to get fans to watch. The, you know, it's this debate of giving things away so you get fan interest so they would watch it. Well, people are going to watch the next episode of Doctor Who, no, but whether I, you put no, that in there or I'm not. I'm just saying, Doc, Doctor Who fans like me got really crazy when we saw. It. Mondesi and Cybermen. Are they going to do a Genesis of the Cybermen? Yeah. And they, you know, 
when I was there, I would, I would have been going crazy going Exodus, Exodus. What does that mean? You know? Did you figure out the whole bottom of the ship, top of the ship time thing? Yeah, because right that's away? been done before. Yeah. Um, I, well, it, most recently in Interstellar, um, I think uh, that was an issue. When they were on the planet, things were really fast, and when they were, he was in orbit outside the, the, whatever. He was really slow. So, yeah. Well, as you know, first of all, as speed increases, time slows down, but yeah. gravity also affects time. So yes. Well, there, there were two things in terms of Doctor Who kind of knew it. Excuse me. That I really loved. The first is when he flipped the blue guy and used the New Zealand Aikido. Yes. Which is from the third doctor, if you go way back. Pertwee, right? I, I don't yeah. think it's been used since they've had the third doctor guest star. <coughs> and the other thing, when, when they did the disguise was the master. That goes, <coughs> excuse me, that goes back to the Peter Davidson era. Mm. Now, yeah. Are you guys, are you guys a fan of Bill? I, I'm not a big fan of Bill. Bill's different, and I think we talked about this before. Bill's growing on me. Um, I just, you know, I I'm trying not to let her become the perils of Pauline. Um, she's kind of getting that way, but uh, we'll see. Well, first thing I thought when they blew a hole through her at the beginning of the episode, I'm thinking, yes. We're done with Bill. <laughs> well, 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 the thing the thing that was a little annoying was Bill was when she uh, sacrificed Earth to save the Doctor in the whole month. Exactly what I was going to say next. All right, but when you think about that, I was thinking in the season final for last year, the Doctor almost destroyed the universe to save Clara. Yeah, that's true, but he didn't. Nobody died. Yeah, that's, but I mean, he's willing difference. to risk screwing up time. I mean, he violated like the most fundamental lord of the, the law of the time lords. You can't bring people back to life. Here, here's the other difference, though. When that was over, right, almost right away, he recognized that what he was doing was wrong. Yeah, there's not been really hardly word one to Bill that what she did was wrong, horribly wrong. There's no remorse from Bill saying, man, that was a really stupid decision. Like, and, you know, at the end of that episode, it's almost like a do-over. Nobody really remembers what happened. Yeah. But, you know, the people who died are still dead. Yeah, some people are and dead. this is all on Bill. Yeah. By the way, did you see the previous week's, uh, Pete? Yes, but I'm trying to remember what it was. It, w it, it was a very almost Robert E. Howard type uh it had beings coming through. Uh, oh yes, 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 yes. The I thought those were eaters of light. Uh, yeah. I thought that was sort of like Robert E. Howard met Frank Belknap Long's Hounds of Tindalos. Yes, that's exactly how I saw it too. You had picks as well. Yep. And the first time I think I've seen the picks on Doctor Who. Not Robert E. Howard's version of it, probably no. a little more closer to the history. Yeah, that was. I enjoyed that episode, um, mostly because it really had very little to do with the Doctor. All right. Um, it also the mystery of the disappearance of the Ninth Legion of Rome is an historical mystery that uh, Carl Edward Wagner even. Uh, tried to answer in uh, Legion from the Shadows. Ah. Brand McMahon novel. Yeah. So the moment I said Ninth, Ninth Legion, I knew that, oh, this is the going into that mystery. So I'm assuming that the Doctor is uh, done at the end of this next episode. He's regenerating. Yeah, we don't know who he's going to regenerate into if they go in that route. No, uh, no, they've kept there's been no announcement. I mean, the speculation was that it was going to happen in the Christmas special. Yeah, well, 
next episode will be interesting if, if for no other reason than that. Yeah. It would, it would, you know, I'm trying to wonder if they're going to play something sneaky. Like, you know, like the doctor regenerates and connect. We now know that the doctor can regenerate in the people that he's met. Yes. Maybe he's somebody in that episode. What if he suddenly be, starts to look like the male master? Yeah. Um, Maybe he's Matt Smith. Yeah, well, yeah, there's been talk about bringing Matt Smith back or the previous one, um, David Tennant. Um, there's, I can't think of the guy's name, uh, the guy from Love Actually, the young guy um, who's in now Murder in Paradise. Um, I haven't seen Love Actually. And if I had, I probably wouldn't admit it anyway. So. Uh, let me see if I can remember his name. Look it up real quick. Um, that's a joke. I don't even know what love actually is about. It's a love story, I'm guessing. It's a bunch of love stories. Oh, all right. Did you uh, figure it out? Yeah, hold on. Uh, Chris Marshall. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah I don't really... I'm not familiar with anything that guy's done. He's a very kind of comedic actor. Um... He, hmm. I, I, I like his work. He's entertaining. Um, he would be very Tom Baker, uh, the kind of doctor. Well, you know that the Missy's going to uh, leave the show too. So we're going to have to have. It's like we. It, it kind of. It's almost like we're going to have to have three regenerations next episode. We're going to have the doctor become somebody else. We're going to have to have the master become Missy somehow. We're going to have become Missy become, God knows whether it'll be another Missy or another master. Right. And hopefully Bill will die. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's close enough. He's a Cyberman. Like, uh, I know. How do you get out of that? I, I mean, really. That was a very frightening episode. Even though I, I saw it coming, you know. Oh yeah, it's it's telegraphed, but you're just hoping that you know they'll get there in time. But you know right. it's years, so yeah. But I, I mean that was very, that was a very frightening, tragic scene. I thought it was all this yeah, it's, but when she goes, I waited for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did like that that last touch with the 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 the, the Cyberman tear. Yeah. Expl you know, kind of explaining some things. All right. I'm not sure yet. It's up to you guys, too, if we're doing an episode next Sunday, because that's the weekend of July 4th. Next yeah. Sunday is July the 2nd. I don't have a guest scheduled, let me tell you that. So. Well, we can do a short show. Yeah, we can. It's fine with me. I'm not, yeah. I don't think I'm going anywhere. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. All right. Well, we might as well then. Um, and then on July 9th, we've got Alistair, Alistair, sorry, Stuart from the Pseudopod podcast. You guys are familiar with that one, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, they've been going, what, 10 years? Something like that? Something like that. A long time. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Soren, thanks yeah. a lot for being on the show today. Yeah, I, this is this is great. I like just listening to you guys. You're entertaining. <laughs> I'd like, well, to play, I'd like to play a really bad board game with you guys once. I think. Oh, that's, I got. Well, something we have to play Cthulhu War someday. Yeah, we need oh, to yeah, do that. Yeah, exactly. Just something where we just bash each other and just. I think you guys have the perfect personalities for that kind of thing that I like. So this week, I have been playing. I have two girls, seven and nine. And I have been, you know, they're off for the summer. So in the evenings, I have been playing Risk with them. Yeah, baby. And the first game, it was like, oh, they made the mistake of letting me have Australia. So, you oh, you didn't tell them about the Australia thing beforehand? What kind of father are you? <laughs> so, so then the second father game, wants to win. <laughs> the second game was like they were like, oh, let's team up and prevent Daddy from getting Australia, and then we'll just wipe him off the map. That lasted for one round, <laughs> and then they just destroyed each other. And I once again just slipped down into Australia. Um, 
And the third game was exactly the same way. They just got they 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 know that they need to beat me. They just can't figure out how to do it. They will and, one day. It looks it'll happen. And they then can't work together. Happen. Well, so what happened was that um, on Thursday night, my wife and son, my son's eighteen, um, decided that they were going to play, and the whole first round was nothing but killing me. <laughs> And I still slipped into Australia and took Australia. He who holds Australia holds the world, owns the world. And then three hours later, everybody else quit. <laughs> is, is this a prelude to eventually gearing them up for Cthulhu Wars, which is a uh, I, yeah, I would love to do that someday. Um, I have some pain about that. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> I get it, but I can't afford it. Good God! Well, I paid oh. for it, and I don't have it. <laughs> you still don't have it. You still don't have it. Wow! Yeah, from the from the first Kickstarter. From this, I don't have anything from the first Kickstarter, and I don't have anything from the second Kickstarter. Did you look under your copy of Dreams from a Witch House? Yeah, that's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> wow! I can't believe you still don't have it. That's not yeah. good. And now the game is completely different. You know. It, it's not. It's not completely different. They just you got an upgrade of, of the boards and uh, some of the tokens. All right. Because that's what what happened when. Because I was looking at the rule book and I'm going, this isn't the doom marker. Oh, you got it in this little box. You got new doom markers. Okay. Yeah. I'm just you know wait. Can I, Go ahead. You know what Soren would be maybe I think I, I'm guessing he would be really good at is a Call of Cthulhu scenario, writing a Call of Cthulhu scenario for us. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's funny. I read cover to cover the uh, you know, the official handbook like ten years ago, just because I found it interesting to read cover to cover. Never actually played the the RPG itself, but just reading that was just uh, very entertaining. Yeah, yeah we've was... we've played that just on a Google Hangout like this before. No, that's very cool. Yeah, one day I do want to give that a try. Yeah, yeah I know so, guys who are, who are, who are in currently writing their like 200th Call of Cthulhu scenario. And th that's insane. I mean, I can remember buying that stuff when I was a teenager. And, and it's still going strong. Yeah, just something about that world, you know? People just can't get enough of that world. Mm hmm Oh, there's so many variation so much you can do with it yeah. you know all right well guys thanks and soren nice to meet you thanks for yeah. talking with us thanks guys talk to you later good night everybody good night everybody. yeah thanks everyone for listening looks like we're gonna have a show next week so we'll we'll see you then thanks <laughs>